everybody. Thanks for joining us today, Thursday, April 30th. I just want to make sure it is a Thursday. Um, our core value this month is advice, and I am so happy to be joined by Sarah McQuaid. Sarah, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please Absolute share pleasure. your journey with us. Oh, um, well, I think we were just talking about my, my journey back to the UK and I am currently sat in my mother's dining room. Um, my mother lives in Birmingham in the middle of England and I live in Massachusetts uh, in the States. And I was skiing in France earlier in March and never quite made it home to the United States. So I'm in the UK and I have been here for about six weeks and it looks like it might be slightly longer as well. Um, so I'm speaking to you from a really interesting place, which is sort of where I started this journey um, many, many moons ago in Birmingham. And um, I'm not sure who or how many are listening, but Chris and I actually went to college together. Not that we, we knew that, but we, um, we found this out a couple of months ago. We did, didn't we? Same college, Solihull College of Technology. We won't tell you the, the year, but we will say that years have been a lot kinder to Sarah than they have to me. So um, if you see my camera go off, it's to help the quality of, the, uh, it's to help the quality of this presentation. So, um, so tell, us, tell us about your, your journey, Sarah, from Castle Bromwich, Birmingham area, Solihull College. Yeah. Tell us what you studied at Solihull College and what, what brought you to here and now will do um so golly in i'll try and keep it short uh because i'm quite old now um so at, at solihull um myself and my twin sister uh were one of the i think the first cohorts to ever study um sports studies um as part of their high school certificate so that was really the trigger for my interest in sports in sports as a profession um, so I studied sport at a sort of college level. I, um, I think I've just lost your picture, Chris. I'm still here. No, I took it off trying to get the quality of your picture better. Uh, um, well, I wouldn't worry about that. I'm, okay. I, I would be delighted if you came back because otherwise it just feels like I'm, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm taking back. you to the rogues gallery. Um, <laughs> um, you got me? I'm so, back. Can you see me now? Yep. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so the, the sort of the sports piece had been fostered really from a young age and I um, trained to become a PE teacher. Um, I didn't like children particularly, so I moved into college lecturing. Um, and at the same time as lecturing in sports studies, sports science, I also started working as a curriculum development expert, so had built curriculums and qualifications and written textbooks and um, become sort of a, a, a chief examiner for awarding bodies sort of based out of London because high school certificates in the UK are set and awarded by external agencies as opposed to the high school so I'd spent a lot of time with them so most of my time really was um, really spent in the education infrastructure rather than the delivery. Um, and at some point in the 90s, I moved out of formal education to Sports Coach UK, who were the government lead agency for coaching in the UK. Um, and I think that's a really interesting point of note that the UK and many developing nations or many developed nations across the globe have a central lead government agency for coaching who are funded directly by the government to in turn fund national governing bodies of sport. And that's what give national governing bodies of sport teeth in terms of um, player development, in terms of coach education, in terms of coach licensing. Um, the, U the US does not have that. There are a number of organizations who are sort of jockeying for position as a kind of a central lead agency, but not necessarily government regulated or government funding. And the US Center for Coaching Excellence is one organization who is doing a good job to position themselves as a, a sort of a resource for all things coaching and coach development. Um, so, I spent some time at Sports Coach UK. The government um, 
back in the day decided to invest a significant amount of money about three million pounds it was six million dollars at the time to professionalize the industry of sports coaching and i was fortunate enough to lead the technical development of that um, which really was to build out a qualifications framework that could be adopted by all sports um, from beginner coach to master coach and really the intent was to ensure that there was a very coherent very standardized approach to coaching in the uk so that it would help employers and end users um, really be able to navigate what is a very complex landscape um, you know what we wanted to ensure was that if a parent wanted to find a qualified coach or a club for their child they'd know what they were looking for so that a, a coach who was sort of a level two soccer coach in one part of the country would be able to provide the same quality of services anywhere else in the country so so that was the the driver was the regulation piece um, and once the government had you know given the rubber stamp um, I left the organization and set up ETC coaching consultants uh, that was 15 years ago and we have been um, marching on since helping organizations develop their systems their people and their their programs that's that's uh, brilliant and just in the framework Sarah what um mm. What was the common theme, say, from the beginner to the master coach? Was there a common thread from that beginner to the master coach within those frameworks? I don't know whether it was um, well, sort of the common thread, and I, it was a new thread that we had did quite deliberately built in, was a very heavy emphasis, not just on the what to coach in terms of the X's and O's, but also on the how to coach. So there was a significant amount of time spent educating coaches around the coaching process. So in terms of some of those simple skills of um, how to explain, demonstrate, observe, analyze, generate and provide feedback. And obviously, you know, sort of from those skills will vary depending upon whether I'm working with, you know, under eights or over 18s as part of the elite pathway. The requirements and the expectations of those skills differ. Um, but we also place a really heavy emphasis on the interpersonal skills. So in terms of the relationships we build, the coaching strategies that we use, our ability to engage players. And there was a, a you know, we really focused on this notion of athlete centered and quite transparently built that into all of the qualifications so that we could help coaches shift from what was historically quite an autocratic, autocratic very sort of you know directive attempt uh directive approach to coaching to something much more engaging yeah brilliant we've had our first question come in already and uh if I you're okay with that can yeah. you hear me you, you ready for mm -hmm. the question the questions from oh. barry webb is in cornwall um gary ah. says uh, barry says uh growth spurts adolescent awkwardness do you have an approach in dealing with this and also does it vary between female and male if yes, could you define how you dealt with this challenge or advise coaches to deal with the challenge? Um, it's a good question that I will go nowhere near answering because I am not by any stretch a sports specific technical expert or expert in, um, you know, sort of the, the, the sort of the child development pieces. My expertise really is around coach learning and coach development um you know so if we're talking about sort of the education and training of um coach developers of coaches of players yes if it's anything tricky or complex um sadly i can't help you barry but um, copy and paste that question for somebody who's far more gifted than i in that in that space and that in itself was a great answer so you did answer it in a way um but you, you within within what you were talking about with the frameworks and the common threads you talked about moving away from the um autocratic to giving players autonomy right being player centered and stuff like that and i know you've done some work with the united soccer coaches convention which is where we met although we probably mm -hmm. met years ago in in a pub in solihull but never knew it right with you yeah, and your yeah. twin sister um but tell us a little bit about the work that you did with the coach development for them and the red balls um and you know having the brief overview that we had a conversation about rush and what advice you would give us 
on our framework per se? Yeah, so when I moved to the United States, I moved based on the expertise I had around coach learning and development. And I had already been doing some work with the US Olympic Committee um, as part of an international coach development program. And the chap who is the program director of that works at the University of Delaware. And he has many, many connections with United Soccer Coaches. So they have created the um, advanced director of coaching and they've created the master coach course and as part of the work I'd been doing with the Olympic Committee I was invited to join the advanced director of coaching team um, and the master of coaching team that they had to introduce the concept of coach learning because if you think about um, those people who are responsible for the employment and deployment of coaches inevitably they're going to have some responsibility whether it's formal or informal whether it's official or unofficial but in some way shape or form they will have a responsibility for helping coaches learn um, so i was asked to join the team to help these coaches think slightly differently um, about how they help coaches learn so be a little bit more proactive and a little bit more thoughtful about that learning process. Um, so the stuff that I had delivered with them landed really well. And I then persuaded Ian Barker to let me create a coach developer diploma. So really, rather than just sort of being parachuted into a master coach course to deliver a couple of hours, was to dedicate a program to this whole notion of helping coaches learn which really and, and the focus of the program that we created with united soccer coaches looks at um the role and concept of the coach developer it does a deep dive into the adult learning principles um we look at how you how you design and deliver um coach learning both in terms of those formal environments in classrooms but also how you provide supportive practice in the field to coaches so that kind of coach evaluation role how do you do that unbelievably well to help coaches reflect on and develop keep developing their skills um, so so that's really the trigger for it and we have delivered it I kind of lost count. We've done a, a couple of those with the Red Bulls and a couple more with United Soccer. So, as I say, the impact has been um, quite significant. How, how that will continue to play out as we move forward in these very uncertain times, I'm, I'm not sure. But the emphasis yeah. has really been around um, developing coaches because very simply, if you've got better coaches, you're going to have better athletes you know they'll have better outcomes and better experiences so it's a, really it's a simple equation the better we can do at this end the better yeah. they will be yeah absolutely um and i think it was uh bill beswick i don't know whether you know bill he's uh oh. the, the, the play sports side often. yeah so he, he would always say you know if you want if you want better players become a better coach but first oh. let's make them better people and remember oh. that they are human beings not human mm -hmm. doings right um yeah but, we segues lovely into a question that's just come in from Damien Frederick, my good friend Damien. He said, is there a different approach to educating volunteers uh, and paid staff? There certainly shouldn't be. Um, but I think the one thing that we do have to be really mindful of with volunteers is that they are already gifting their time to the club. And I think we have to be very mindful of the additional expectations that we place on them from a learning and development perspective. So I think we've got to ask ourselves, you know, what, what about their commitment? We've got to ask about their capacity. Um, you know, we've got to ensure that what, whatever we ask of them or whatever we require them to do doesn't, doesn't necessarily drive them away. Everything we do has got to draw them in. So I, I, I'm actually thinking potentially we, we pay even more attention to the volunteers and treat them even better if that's possible, then we might yeah. do our paid staff. Yeah, so so in in our club world, you know, how would that look? How would that look mm. um, in, in your, you know, tr spending more time with them, treating them better? How, how does yeah. that? 
Um, I think it, I think it starts right from the get go. So once we have a volunteer who comes in, um, I think there has to be some quality time spent establishing, you know, what's their motivations to join. What are the skills and expertise they have? And remember, whilst they might be beginner coaches, they're not beginner people. They will have experiences from everybody everywhere else. And I think it's our job to harness those experiences and apply them where where they can be best used. And I, you know, I'd also want to ask those volunteers about, you know, their comfort levels, their confidence levels. I'd want to ask them about, you know, where they see themselves working. Um, so I would certainly be operating from their agenda in the first instance, as opposed to just sort of trying to shoehorn them into the gaps I believe they've got. Um, mm -hmm. And if I had the luxury of lots of people, I'd want to give them the opportunity to um, potentially shadow and observe just so that they could gain confidence and competence and gradually pick up more and more of those coaching coaching roles. It, it, if that was part of the requirement was sort of the upskilling piece. Obviously, if I had somebody coming in who was a volunteer but had got that sort of sports specific background, um, you know, then and what's really interesting is that, you know, volunteers tend to take, take a couple of shapes. You've got the eager parents, um, you know, who potentially know very little about the sport, but, you know, bags of energy. And then at the other end, you've got loads of you've got people coming in who potentially know, you know, ex players who know lots about the sport, but don't necessarily have the experience. So, you know, my job is to sort of find out, well, what have they got and what can I give them to complement the experience that they're bringing to the club? Yeah, I think that's huge. And, you know, simply like from our club perspective, we rely heavily on volunteers. So usually it's a parent coach, mm. um, a parent who's volunteered because nobody else would coach the team. So we call them either, we have two categories too, volunteer or voluntold, right? Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and then mm. sometimes, sometimes, you know, we, we will, once we get them in and we, we do a, a couple of trainings with them, which isn't enough. Um, we send them weekly curriculum, but I love what you just said there, though, about spending time for them and, and, and just seeing their agenda. Unfortunately, in the reality of a club world, you just aren't afforded that time, which sounds silly, but it's so important because the volunteer coaches who are working at the foundation are so important to the growth and development of the children that they're charged with, but also the growth of the sport and the program. You know, mm, and I think you know the quality of the volunteers' experience within the club and their investment to the club can be, or or, or might well be, dictated by the quality of the relationship that they have with peer coaches and the director of coaching. And so I think you know there has to be some significant time that's invested in cultivating the relationship and valuing the contributions and I mean I'm not talking necessarily about some formalized reward and recognition program but it's just the simple things um, that, that that we can do just as people just as very yeah. interested and professionally curious people to value that the people are there questions are what can I do to help you how did the session go what worked unbelievably well what didn't you know, so and I think it's that sort of that informal mentoring type role that we can take on board and that genuine interest that helps them see that actually they have got something and are contributing something that's massively useful, not just from a soccer perspective, but from a, a sort of a people development perspective and a little people development perspective. Yeah, and, and I think it's huge, right? And like I say, we do we do do a lot of things for them, but it's not enough. I've always said it's not enough per se, um, but just listening to you, I'm scribing. I've got three pages of notes so far. Um, <laughs> this question's, no, that's great. Don't be sorry, it's brilliant. Um, this question has come in from Debbie and Debbie's a retired PE teacher. And she says, do you educate all the coaches the same at all levels? As with children, adults don't learn the same rate. Very good question, Debbie. Um, and again, I think the answer is it depends. 
Um, so whilst I think we can offer access to a generic education program, so if we think about formal training and qualifications that people will access, you know, the learning outcomes are the same for everybody. The need to know content is the same for everybody. Um, if content is being presented in manuals or online, it's the same for everybody. But I think what's really different is the opportunities that we have, particularly when we're working in person, or the opportunities we have when we're working in a one-to-one -one relationship, where we can flex our approach to education and training and use strategies that really engage people in their own learning. So what works for Chris may not work for you, Debbie. So what I would want to do is to invest in some time in the relationship and really find out how you tick, how you prefer to work so that we could engage you in your learning process rather than just hitting and hoping with the generic content. And again, that takes time. It does take time to adopt a learner-centered approach to everything we do. And whilst it might be a loss leader time-wise in the first instance, I think you get so much more for that investment longer term. Um, so, so the answer is, Debbie, I would, I would attempt to color everything I do to meet the needs of individuals. And I think, you know, back in the P days, we would have very simply referred to that as differentiation. Yeah differentiation a word that's not used very often right mm. uh, these days and the way it was explained to me was remember quality streets remember mm. you, you you know the ones that you like you know the ones that you don't like but what about the montelemar what about the one in the middle that we yeah. all forget about and that's where the percentage yeah. is. and you know mm. in the same note there obviously you know we we try and cater to learners needs um when we start our volunteer coaches meetings, I usually start, Sarah, by asking everybody, raise your, want, raise your hand if you were once a child, because, um, mm. and of course, everybody's hand goes up. And then the questions we ask is, why do you coach? Why do you coach the way you coach? What do you coach? Um, and I go around and I do meetings and people ask me, well, what do you coach? And I usually say I coach children, but I use football as the vehicle, mm. soccer for our American friends. And I think so much of what you've said is so rich in the relationship aspect. Um, the connection to people. Well, what is it their needs? What is their agenda? Um, but then also the, the the connection and the relationship, right? Mm. Because um, everybody does have different needs, and you can't just standardize um, mm. with one brush, right? Mm -mm. So, but I, I think it's huge. So, having done the coach developers course with the USC and Red Bulls, mm. what? What would you, is there anything you'd change about that? I and mean, when you look back and you reflect on, on the stuff and looking at that now and doing the in-person stuff, how much of a need will there be to do online stuff? Because, you know, is the convention a thing of the past now? Is Anaheim 2021 going to happen with the, you know, and of course, if we could predict how we look post-pandemic, we'd probably be uh, billionaires now, not sitting here having the conversation mm. with each other per se. Well, I, I, I think the, the pandemic and this um, enforced period of isolation, and it's not just sort of a physical isolation, it's sort of an isolation from sort of almost everything that we know and have been familiar with, is giving us an opportunity to really question how well we did what we did and actually, do we need to continue to do the same moving forwards? Um, and the answer is absolutely no. And, you know, when people say, let's get back to normal, I kind of start to squint a little bit because I don't think it will be a back to normal. I think we're navigating towards a new normal. Yeah. And I, I think that there are some very thoughtful questions that we need to ask ourselves so on a very personal level you know even before the pandemic I was asking myself the question do I need to fly across the country to deliver three 40-minute sessions as part of a a coaching clinic and quite frankly the answer is no because you know a it's doing nothing for the globe's carbon footprint um b it's doing nothing for my health and sanity in terms of you know 16 hours on planes within 48 hours or whatever it was um but also are there other ways that we can do this and the answer is absolutely yes you know so where we are right now so and again i don't think we can continue just churning out web 
webinar after webinar. Um, but I think if we can adopt a very blended approach to our learning, so if we can figure out in terms of the courses that we used to run, what's the difference between the need to know content and the nice to know content? So the nice to know content for me, I think can sit online and we can explore in conversations like this, but what's the need to know stuff I absolutely need to say for the in-person learning and the in-person courses? And how is it then that I can structure the offline learning or the, or the, the sorry, how can I structure the online learning to act as a trigger for the in-person stuff and I guess it does assume a lot in terms of um, people studying what they're meant to study at the required time so that you can effectively flip the classroom and really focus on the experiential pieces when you're in, on those courses so that's where what I'm going to be asking myself moving forward is do I need to be in person or can we facilitate it remotely and in fact, I'm just spending um, some time with the professional tennis registry, helping them think about a course that we've created that was six days in length and helping them think about, well, what if those six days can now sit online so that we can actually move to a really high quality three day in person event? You know, and, and that in itself is a lovely challenge. Yeah, I know the it, balls it, in their it, court. It, the balls in their oh, court, sure. right, Sarah? Yeah, nice, nice tennis sure. club. Um, you know, so I think I think we have got an opportunity to think differently. Absolutely. I, I, I Like we were talking before we started hitting record, I just think it's a unique opportunity to reshape our lives and uh, mm. include more of the stuff that we love um, and mm. some of the stuff that we can leave behind. And, uh, you know, we can really learn and grow from this, you know. I, oh, I, if we're so open much. to it. Yeah. You know, so you know the learning assumes that we are open to learning it assumes we're motivated to learn and it also assumes that we're good reflectors so that we can actually think back and think about well okay in terms of what i was doing you know what was it that worked unbelievably well what did i like doing what did the people i was working with like what did they value from those experiences so there's a really clinical reflection exercise that's got to go on before we can actually map forward to determine what bits of the old can we take into the new um you know and what bits out of the old do we take into the new and repurpose and actually what bits of the old do we just take and just leave there yeah and and i think doing it with the usc and the, the companies you work with you know i know that coach <coughs> developers and coach instructors there's often the the power imbalance right knowing and whether we get a true reflection of somebody who's gone through the course knowing that they hold the power for you to pass and fail can be very interesting um mm. you know having gone through my ussf license back in early 2000 and then going through it recently mm. the it, the shift was humongous in the way mm. the federation has delivered their their lessons and i know that uh, having gone through nscaa now the usc the way it used to be is their shift was so much that their focus was so much on the learner and we want to help you pass as opposed to we want to break you down yeah and you know it's interesting you use the word sort of power fail and you know sort of much of my early years as a professional in education was spent in the world of assessment not mm -hmm. just in terms of you know designing um exams that thirty thousand students across the uk were going to take and that i would have to leave lead, lead a moderation team to mark you know, and that was, you know, scaled, you know, in essence, there was sort of a pass fail, it'll be sort of structured mm -hmm. into sort of different bands. But it's interesting, you know, I hear that same language used in coach education that we used to use in academic education. And I'm, I'm not sure it's necessarily language that should persist in coach education, because when we think about coaching, you know, we're thinking about vocational skills. Yeah. So actually vocational skills, do we measure as pass fail or actually are we, particularly at this beginner's end of the spectrum? It doesn't necessarily uh, translate as well at the elite end, but actually at the beginner level, I want to ask myself, are these coaches competent? Are they competent to plan, design, deliver, evaluate coaching for this particular cohort of people? So would I be confident for them to coach my child? Um, you know, so that's the language. And I think, you know, where I've spent a lot of time over the years is helping assessment move from a very clinical place of, 
you know, jumping out from behind a tree with a clipboard and bottle butt and glasses waiting to say, ah, I got you. You know, yeah. and it was all really designed on the kind of the catch them out, you know, and actually everything I do now is designed to catch coaches in. It's designed yeah. to catch coaches being unbelievably good. And that's not about compromising the quality or the integrity of the assessment that's built in. That's just enabling them to really perform well throughout all phases of their learning. Yeah, and I, and I think that's that's huge, right? You know, is there growth? Do that, you know, I mean, when, when we look at coach education and coach development, or, uh, you know, a lot of people could observe a session and then they make up their mind about the session. Oh, that wasn't very good for X reason. But the, the coach doesn't know what the objective of the session is or the coach watching doesn't know the mm. objective. So how can you assess when you don't know what the objective was? Mm. You know? I com so. completely agree. And, it, and it's interesting, you know, so many assessors make up their mind within the first minute or minute and a half of whether they believe that coach is, is competent or not. I'm like, oh, hang on a minute. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Bias, how on right? can you make a fair, valid, valid and reliable decision on 65 seconds when actually, you know, this session's an hour. I can't demonstrate everything you need me to model in the first 65 seconds. Um, you know, so this is where with, you know, with the, assessor training that we've designed and developed over the years we really do do, do a deep dive into you know well what does fair valid and reliable look like what do you need to do to be able to give the coach every chance of success do you know to catch yeah. them being excellent they yeah. need longer than 16 seconds well when, when we look at that i think it's um we look at coaching as a whole too so for example as a coach we generally step in to correct something right oh. and when something's gone wrong but for me as a coach i want to be at my loudest and celebrate <laughs> when something's gone great you know mm. um and just say hey you know did you see samantha did you guys see what samantha just did that's exactly what we want um and there's not many coaches out there that that do it that way as opposed to you know catch them catch them in like you said or catch mm. them being good you know um here in virginia I got challenged when I first came here and the challenge was, um, can you be ingrained in the community? So I, I took the challenge on and we started visiting elementary schools and we would mm. teach soccer through the PE class. So we visited 42 of the 55 elementary schools and we used positive discipline um, as opposed to through those PE classes. So for example, if I wanted, uh, I would say, hey, thanks for having your shirt tucked in and your foot on the ball. And the kids mm. invariably would want to please instead of saying, don't sit on your ball, be quiet mm. yeah. um, and stuff like that. I mean, it just goes so much further, right? And mm. you help uh, fill people's emotional tanks as opposed to draining and defeating people, you know? Mm. But, um, no, I love I it. Love your, I love your, I know I love what you do, you know, catch them in, catch them in, catch them in. We do have a couple more questions. Yeah, so yeah, carry on with your thought, Madame. Go after you, Sarah. No, I, I was just sort of saying that was really when we were designing the UK coaching certificate and you said what what were the common threads, you know, this whole new thread really was sort of, you know, we spent a lot of time in our coach developer programs looking at the difference between pushing and pulling from a sort of a learning perspective. You know, when we start to think about pulling um, you know, which really is about the, the sort of putting the athlete at the centre or the learner at the centre of their own process. Strategies you've just talked about, like the positive discipline, like the problem solving, like the game based learning, um, like the peer coaching are all strategies that we can use that actually bring players into their learning. But if I am a volunteer coach, if I am a brand new coach and I don't have a background in either education or sports coaching, then I don't know what I need to know to be highly effective. And actually my default in terms of acting as a coach is probably going to be based on my own experiences as a player or the coaches that I have seen over the time. If that's the only reference point I have, then that's, that's how I'm going to do it myself, which, you know, unless you've had a crackingly good coach growing up or seen some high quality coaching, then the danger is we're just going to repeat and reinforce poor practice. Yeah. 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 And that, that begs me to another thought or question, you know, if you have 25 years of coaching experience, but you've done the same 
year 25 times, is it really 25 years of experience? Mm. You know, if we've not tried something new or evolved. Um, Understood. Yeah, Sarah, this question comes from Damien. He says, on a club level, what would be the top two or three need to know things for coaches? Um, it's a great question, Damien. And the answer is, it depends. It depends. Um, so it really does depend on who the club is, what their stage of development is. So in terms of, are they a brand new club um, who are sort of, you know, borrowing spaces, people and equipment, or are they an established club with their own spaces? Also depends on the context that we're talking about. So, you know, if there is a player development pathway in place, what are we specifically talking about? And then also if we start to think about, you know, that one or two thing focus, is the focus oriented towards the players? Is it oriented towards the coaches? Is it oriented towards the club? Um, so it's difficult to give you a specific answer, but what I'd be very good at is asking the tricky questions to help you determine what are those two or three really important things. Um, yeah. If I were a gambling girl, I would say they've probably got bugger all to do with the X's and the O's and they're probably more to do with everything else that sits as sort of integral to developing the whole child. Brilliant. Um, the, what, and I love what you said there, right? And it does depend, right? What is the club's mission? What is the club's vision? What are their core values? What's their why? Are you living those things? Yeah. You know? um, the, the thing I would say is, you know, be kind to children. <laughs> you know, mm. if you're working with children, be kind to them, right? Um, that just would be, be a given for any coach. Yeah. Yes, well. You know, yes. Just be kind, period. It's not just to people, yes. it's to the planet, it's to this place. It's yeah. just be kind. Yeah, M mm. Mother Earth is breathing right now, right? We oh, can see the so fish in Venice. She is. Maybe this, maybe this is Mother Earth recalibrating and saying, could I just have five yeah. minutes? Yeah. yeah, no, I, I think you're spot on and we, we've discussed that. Um, so what in, in having coached in the UK or sorry, mm -hmm. having developed and working with top coaches and top people and coach developers in the UK and the US, what are the similarities and what are the differences? Um, good question. I would say the UK has had, has got a bit of a head start on the US. Um, so certainly in the UK, we were, when we were building the UK coaching certificate, we recognised very quickly that the quality of coach education um, that coaches were receiving was only ever going to be as good as the programme that was designed, the people that were in front of coaches leading the delivery of the programmes, whether you call them tutors or facilitators or coach developers, was only ever going to be as good as the you know, sort of the assessment and the mentoring and the evaluation. So at the same time as building this coaching framework, we built a coach developer framework. And we use that um, to help us really develop an army of people who could lead the delivery of coach education in this country. So we, we've had a bit of a head start for 15 or 20 years. And when I, when I um, moved to the UK seven or eight years ago, uh, US, sorry, get where I am. When I moved to the US um, and I, I was awarded a green card on the strength of the work I'd done in um, the UK and I thought oh, this is going to be really easy when I, I moved to the US and I thought well you know everybody will know you know who the coach developer is and what coach development is and, and people are going to be coming stamping my door down um, which was not the case. Um, so much of my time since arriving in the US has been sales and marketing, really championing the concept of coach education, coach development, high quality coach education and coach development. Um, you know, so for example, when I, I worked at USA football, American football, not soccer, um, and they had a level one program and their level one program was a 90 minute online program that really just sort of focused on the tech tech. Um, which barely even scratched the surface. And when I spoke to their advisory board, I asked them how many of these gentlemen would have their Mercedes serviced by a technician who'd only completed 
a 90 minute online course and they looked at me like I was a complete fool and said well of course not and I said but it's okay to leave your children and grandchildren with uneducated coaches um, you know so so to that extent the sales and marketing piece has been quite significant but what I do know is that organizations and individuals who have been open and receptive to the messages have just thought it is the missing missing link because actually if we've got people who can design high quality learning experiences for coaches and help coaches learn about the X's and the O's and all of that other stuff that's essential, um, then actually we are just going to serve to enhance athlete experiences. And so that's what's happened. It, it is a rolling snowball and I'm mm -hmm. thrilled to be part of it. Were you, were you involved with developing the framework for the USOPC as well? The coaching framework um, that they put together no i i wasn't um but i know that I, I certainly know the people who were involved in that um and i certainly know when you put the quality coaching framework side by side with the international coaching framework i was really pleased to see that you know there are some real synergies between the two documents and i think the the one point of note that they that the americans have decided to focus on is the holistic development of the whole child. So overtly in that document, it talks about the four C's. Um, you know, we can debate whether there's four, five or six C's, but the USOPC have identified that confidence, competence, and I think character and caring are the qualities that they want to really encourage the development of. What I would say is what's potentially missing from that list is the transparent development of a child's creativity so when you look at the research around four five or six c's creativity stands in those other lists and i do wish it stood um overtly in, in the list of the sort of usopc document but you know the work that they have done and the work they've done around the athlete development model is a fabulous reference point for organizations who are seeking to create a really informed system because if you think about it, the athlete development model, it's a bit like a curriculum. Um, you know, so people talk about K through 12. There's a curriculum that identifies what it is that children are meant to learn across the various different subjects. What's the point they're going to transition to the next year grade, to the next year grade, to the next year grade. And that's what the athlete development model gives us is a reference point for the development of a child's physical literacy and their personal and social skills at each of those discrete stages. And the fact that we know what those are, that will tell sports organisations who the coach needs to be to operate effectively in that role. Because the coach who's operating here in the fundamentals is going to be very different from the coach offering here. They need different knowledge, different skills, different capabilities to be effective. So that's what the athlete development model does and the quality coaching framework do is help tell us what coaches need to know and do and i think it's our job then to design programs and support coaches to acquire um those skills yeah and it's you know it's funny that you bought the word not funny but the creative aspect when we when we look at a school system and we go into the school system and we ask kindergartners who's creative every single child raises their hand and then by mm. you know the time they're high school seniors if you We're ask them Pardon? I said we've knocked it out of them. Yeah, Creative. we do. We so knock we it out. Yeah. It. Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, it's yeah. crazy. I'm gonna. There's a question. It's mm. quite a long question from Jeff Muir in Missouri. I'm I'm gonna Hi, unmute Jeff. him. I'm gonna unmute him so he can ask the question himself. Uh, I'm just gonna clumsily uh, work around. So Jeff, be ready to be unmuted. I've unmuted you, Jeff. Join us, you wanna ask your question? Yes, hi Sarah, thanks. Thanks for taking the question. Um, we see so many soccer clubs these, these days, they grow, they're getting large, and there's need for good quality coaches. And my thought, flash question to you is, how important do you feel it is that those coaches and clubs, club directors, DOCs sit down and have an honest, conversation where they're talk about philosophies and and priorities in order to help both the club grow and create a good environment for the players as well as give that coach an opportunity to grow because what i see is a lot of times 
because the demand is greater than the supply, we're just taking coaches and we're putting them, entrusting them to handle our players. Sorry for the length. No, it, it's it's okay. And I, I actually think you've answered your own question. Um, I think it's unbelievably important. But um, what I would hope is that every club um, in the sports space, whether it's soccer or not, were very clear about um, their identity, their philosophy and their approach. And I think there's a real difference here, Jeff, in between the club's philosophy as in the kind of you know the, the the corporate vision and mission and their coaching philosophy and their coaching vision and mission and I think those are two different things and inevitably the vision for coaching should be aligned to the athlete development model you know so and I think the Red Bulls call it their footprint and um, they call it I think it, I'm sure it's the Red Bulls footprint but you know what I'm talking about is every club having real clarity around the framework by which they will help their players transition. And I think once that's established, that's the non-negotiable. And I think your real challenge then is to have that collaborative conversation where you can clearly share the vision and values of the club. You can share the sort of the philosophy for coaching and then have the conversation that asks every coach to identify what they will personally do to contribute towards achieving the vision and mission and I think it's then our responsibility to say well okay how can we help you achieve that so what are the knowledge and skills and qualities that you've got and we can then help determine what the gaps are so that we can attempt to fill those gaps so that they've got as many resources as they possibly can to be able to deliver on the club's philosophy um, so I, I don't quite know how I've helped to answer the question but I, I think yes yeah, no, I think that's great. I just, I think the takeaway is that there has to be this process between the coach and the club before we can get to that point where they can go out and coach and grow as a coach and, and help our players. So that, that process is very important. Yeah, and just kind of a health warning here, Jeff, I would be really mindful about how you manage the, the this particular sort of conversation with all of your coaches. Um, you know, there is a temptation to kind of frame it as a bit of a diktat, um, you know, which, which might well serve to isolate coaches. You know, I think there's something here about the manner and intent and how you manage, you know, that sort of pre-season meeting with the club, with the coaches to ensure that everybody's sort of singing from the same song sheet. So there's something really important about the community of practice that you create to ensure that you're all on the same page. Great. Thanks for your insight. Pleasure. Thanks, Jeff. I've just muted him again. Uh, we've got another question come in, Sarah, and I want to be sensitive of your time as well. No, hey, um, I have no idea what time it is, actually. Um, 10 to 6. Would, ten, so we'll, 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 you let me know when you've got to run. Um, okay. Barry I, Webb I've, got, I've, I've got it an hour, so. Okay. <laughs> Barry Webb asks, would you recommend specialising in just one age group? Again, it depends. Depends, yeah. It really depends upon, uh, you know, I would want to ask the question of, the, I would want to ask the coach in terms of, you know, their experiences, their confidence, their competence, you know, you'd want to get a sense of how well um you know the coaches work with that particular group so is it their expertise with the people or is it the expertise within that particular age bracket um you know so i think there's loads of variables at play to help you determine whether a coach migrates with the team or whether the coach stays and i think you could talk yourself Both into ways. the solution and it would be you know and i think if it was an informed decision it would it could work either way yeah um and if it was to you know i don't think you know a teacher stays with first grade second grade for example there's no teacher that takes the the children from kindergarten all the way through to high school unless they're homeschooled right so again yeah. it, it does depend on on what the coach wants and you know yeah. are we the same coach we were 10 years ago right 
quite well, simply. And I, you know, and I think our experiences change and our aspirations change. What I do think is really important that with any coach and if we're the director of coaching, we, we handle with care. You know, so if we do want to shake things up by moving coaches around, let's ensure that we have the conversation that really makes the coaches aware of you know the rationale behind the decision making and you know let's make those decisions sensibly and you know with some tact yeah yeah and in collaboration sometimes too right mm -hmm. yeah, and collaboration yeah. is really important if i feel yeah. that i have been involved in the decision making process i'm so much more likely to be committed to that journey yeah and i think that goes to answer jeff's question too right Mm. getting the coaches to buy in um, mm. with what they're doing really as well important. yeah you know um, so listen if there's any more questions type them in now I don't want to keep Sarah all day she's given so much of her time already but I do have some questions for you Sarah no, um, go, go, go ahead our core value this month is advice what advice would you give to your younger Sarah McQuaid move mm. to America sooner maybe <laughs> um, don't go skiing in France in the, when the pandemic's about to break out. Yeah. Um, what advice would I give? Trust the process. Love that. Love that. Um, it's taking it's someone's... Work me tomorrow, my answer might change. So it just had a okay. That's yeah, okay. Trust, trust the process. Yeah, trust the process. Um, and then, you know, what song, soundtrack or movie would best describe your life? Groundhog Day right now during this yeah. pandemic, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't actually mind that because my life is so chaotic. You know, I am literally, I um, travel, 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 travel. It just so to actually to be in the same place and um, actually to be in my, I didn't grow up in this home, but mum's been here a long time. So it does feel like my childhood home. But um, uh, I saw there's a thing on Facebook where people are being challenged to do their kind of like 10 favourite band covers. Um, and when I was at Solihull Sixth Form College, I used to love um, Yazoo. Yeah. And I just had seen the cover of an album upstairs at Eric's and I thought, God, I love that. And then I started to think about, well, what happened to the communards? Um, so I think, I think because I'm here today, I'd end up going back to something from, from the late eighties. And yeah. as I say, upstairs at Eric's might be a good listen. Yeah. Fantastic. So we're, we're going to finish with some one worders. Um, mm. So I'm going to ask you some questions and you get one word answers. Ooh, right? So I want to provoke some thought right here. Um, it depends, can be hyphenated and be like two answers. Right. First okay. one is Solio, Solio College of Technology. Solio Tech. Starter. Starter. Coaching. All slash encompassing. All, All hyphen encompassing. encompassing. Brilliant. I love it. Uh, coach development. My passion. Passion. That's our, that's our uh, core value next month, by the way. Vision. Oh, fab. Vision. Vision. And so I want to give you a sentence. Vision. You can. Three. You can. You can. Uh, when you think vision you think 2020 and you just think clarity but actually clarity isn't enough you need 360 degree vision so you can check the blind spots so 360. i love that i love that mentoring humbling and then finally usa home yeah i love it brilliant Sarah, you've been fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us really and everything. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And a really, really some fabulous questions. And, and I'm sorry yeah. I couldn't answer the first one. That's okay. way too tricky. Yeah. We um is there is there any advice um you you'd give the listeners right now? We're getting a lot of thank yous typing in. Um, mm. is there any advice you'd give the listeners, any recommended reading um or final words that you could give us? Yeah, my Final words, and I don't know who you are, I don't know what spaces you work in, I don't know what roles you have or what sort of seniority you are within your spaces. Um, 
take the time moving forward to reflect on where you've been, where you are now, and how you navigate to that new normal. And what I would do is start from the ground up, look at the infrastructure and the systems that you have in place. And if you are going to make any changes, make sure those changes are made at the foundational level. Because otherwise, if you attempt to change what's sitting on top of the foundations, there'll be no substance. And again, they may well just crack in time. So really start down deep with the systems, uh, with a systems analysis. Brilliant. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. Um, we Pleasure. Are, we're, we're so great to have you. Great advice, Barry Webb says. Uh, remember, friends, we do have a couple next week. We do have a couple of webinars. I do want to say thank you to Sarah. She is brilliant. Um, my claim to oh, fame is having gone to the same college with her. Stay safe and wash your hands is my other piece yeah. of advice. Yeah, brilliant. My final word is remember physical distance, so social existence, so we can be socially connected. So you've I been love it. brilliant. You can use that, Sarah. You can use that. And uh, I look forward to your return to the US and getting on the Coach Developers course with you. So fabulous. I will All let right. you know when the first one is. Hold me to that. Hold me to that. So, all right. Will thanks do. everybody for joining us. Stay safe, like Sarah says. Wash your hands, and we will talk to everybody on the flip side. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Sarah. I'm going to end the webinar, Sarah, so we can uh, let you go. Okay. But then I can't say goodbye to you. I'll, I'll send you an email. Okay, do that. And thank you again brilliant. for the opportunity. It's really lovely to connect. Yeah, brilliant. Hopefully you enjoyed it, and uh, as mm. much as I did. So. Thank you. We'll talk again soon. Stay well. All right. Bye. Cheers. Enjoy Bye. your fishing trips. Bye. Bye. <laughs> See ya. Bye. <laughs>